It is good to be back. It's Dr. James, Dr. Mike, the bullier of children, as we know him now. Just kidding. No, you're gonna... you know, I've been known to push around a few eight-year-olds on the playground. <laughs> hey, 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 kid, get out of here. <laughs> weekly webinar is back, or bi-weekly webinar, I should say. Dun, dun, dun. Here to answer your questions. Dr. Mike, how are we doing? Good. Is the bi-weekly webinar kind of like used to be the weekly webinar? And then it's like, you know, I think I'm really into curious. girls, but guys are looking cute. Mm-hmm. Bi-curious webinar? All of the above. Honestly, off the cuff, but it's not not politi- it's not politically incorrect. It's just like straight up. Bisexual people won the fucking lottery. They have all the fun. <laughs> it's total bullshit. The rest of us are stuck with half the fucking options. They're stuck with fucking double, bro. Double. How the fuck Man, is that fair? I know. Well, we should probably get to questions before we shoot ourselves in the foot with stupidness. <laughs> which is what we always do. We'll do that at some point in the middle. All right. This is a hell of a name, James. Here we go. Straight from the countries of Europe comes Jules Gromers. Oh, I got that one. Yep. (laughs) Jules. It also makes me think of the, the, isn't there like a cigarette uh, replacement thing called the Jewel? Is it really? (laughs) I think it's like a, uh, yeah, like a vaporizer (laughs) cigarette wiener offer thing. The Jules, of course, it's all jokes here, so please take no offense. This name, Jules Grommers, is like what you would be intro in with a movie about like spycraft and the CIA. Oh, I was gonna like say it's like evil Germans for spy. super terrorists, like <laughs> he is a techno terrorist for hire for any country, and he's originally from Sweden but grew up in Denmark. And he's Jules Grommers, and he is impossible to catch. It's easily like an Avengers style villain, 100%. All right, he asks. If you do a sport with unpredictable forces on the shoulder, wrestling, climbing, rugby, etc. I would say climbing is pretty predictable forces, but nonetheless. Um, how would you approach training the shoulders to prepare them for violent eventualities? What a well-worded question, James. All you, my friend. Yeah, so this uh, I like, I like the, way, the way you're thinking, but this actually is a very simple answer. So you train the shoulder in the way that is within the realm of specificity for whatever activity that you're doing, right? So that would mean making your shoulders uh, in whatever part of the shoulder girdle or, you know, clavicular end or whatever side that you're working on. It's strong and has the work capacity within the ranges of motion that you should expect within the sport. Now, some of those are going to be bigger or smaller. So again, constrained by specificity. And then for the um, kind of the impact or contact portion, that's simply a matter of conditioning as a result of practicing the actual sport and activity. So kind of, it's like a two-part answer. And one is like train the muscles within the realm of specificity for the activity. That's kind of a no-brainer. And then condition the muscles and joints and structures to the impacts and uh, forces of the activity itself. So here's a really bad example of rugby. Since you threw rugby in there, I'll, I'll do that one. A lot of people are afraid of getting contact injuries in rugby, so they avoid contact during practice. Well, guess what happens when they start doing their first live couple matches? They're not conditioned to the impacts of making tackles, breaking tackles, and as a result, they get injured. So part of your periodization scheme for whatever it is, wrestling, rugby, you know, contact sports, is what I would just call um, conditioning the body to those forces and impacts and falls and, and you know, all around to some of those situations so that um, you have a built up tolerance to that over time. And you can, you can, you can take it. A classic example in my kickboxing is uh, somebody who checks a kick whose shins are not conditioned for that. Oof. Right. And oof, oh. break a tibia, um, stuff like that. How do you prevent that from happening? Well, you condition your shins, you know, and that just comes through incrementally more and more intense uh, practice of things like initially kicking bags and then kicking things like partners with shin pads on and then eventually moving into live sparring at some point. So there's like a progressive component there of conditioning the body to those types of forces. There you go. Nothing prepares you for the forces, like an incremental exposure to the forces. Which mm-hmm. blows, but... Yeah. All right. Excellent answer. Next up uh, is Gustavo Leal Gomez. Ooh, another spicy one. Who just who just put out his Cuban cigar in his butler's face. <laughs> I'm done with this. I need new butlers. <laughs> he says, Dr. Mike, do you still train in blow job job? If yes, do you find hard 
to manage hypertrophy adding BJJ as you get more and more advanced. So it's actually easier as I get more and more advanced in BJJ because I use less energy and physical effort and more technique and positioning and patience and timing. So my physical exertion in jujitsu actually tends to fall over time, which is so sweet. So I remember the times when jujitsu was just this totally draining thing. And now I can choose it to be totally draining or I can choose it to not be totally draining and I still get great training out of it. Um, but on the hypertrophy side, yeah, as I get more advanced, it's tougher. Uh, and thus for the next several years, as I'm trying to peak in my bodybuilding sort of lifetime achievement, I'm actually choosing to do um, less jujitsu than normal, two to three sessions a week, uh, maybe two to four instead of sort of three to five. And I do less hard rolling uh, in more technical positional work so that I can de-stress uh, that. Does that make me get not as good as jiu-jitsu as I could be? Yes, and it's a trade-off, but it allows my MRV to open up more to um, to my lifting. So that's the thing, yeah. And I mean, you can imagine like the, the impact of even just changing what you do in practice from, let's say taking a couple, even just maybe 20 minutes of live rolling at the end of a, a practice session, you just eliminate that and you just do drilling and your systemic fatigue, like, it goes through the roof, Nightmare. right? Like that's a huge difference when you're making like competitive, I don't want to say maximal effort, but it's like competitive efforts, which are not always maximal, like in that sense, especially if you're like, like Dr. Mike was saying, he's more trained. So he's probably less spazzy and, and less prone to making like inefficient maximal efforts on stuff that he doesn't need to, you know? So that's a situation where you can see like, if your systemic fatigue is limiting, like you drop out the live competition stuff. <laughs> Or just choose not to go as hard. You know, there's a bunch of stuff I do in competition where I know I could win a position, win points or win the match if I make this move, but I choose not to make it because it's really systemically like, so for example, if I'm crawling up someone's lapel and they're resisting a lot, sometimes I'll switch positions to crawl up another way to pass guard versus grind crawling. If it was a competition, I would just grind right through them, but fuck that. I'm doing an extra pull workout doing that. So yep. I sometimes make accommodations like that. But it's really, once you get the ego out of the way, it's really easy to make the accommodation. It's tough though, because you're in a, you're in a physical fight and you want to win. We all do. So it's tough. Great answer. Next up, P. Nagi. What the fuck? Bye. 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 Balent. Balent. Yeah, that sounds right. Panagi Balent. Panagi. Bailiff, get Mr. <laughs> Balent out here. Hey, man, Panagi, is that one of them Italian sandwiches? Woo, doggy. All right. <laughs> P. Nagi asks the following. He says, I had a really weird dream about Dr. Mike, mm. but I thought worth sharing. 50s kid says, gee whiz, all sorts of funny stories start like that. <laughs> I don't know where this is going. We'll oh see. Boy. Oh, boy. I was trying to wash my teeth. and Wash my, your teeth? As first problem. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> so uh, while Mike was trying to figure out what is the ideal rep count in RAR for my brushing, ooh, I was about uh, eight reps on one side, and Mike got him. He started to shout like a maniac. Uh, then I need to stop right now because I will overreach my enamel. Thanks to the advice, in the end, my teeth were brighter than ever. I might have to watch, I might have watched too much RP in the last few weeks. It sounds I, like you it. You sure as hell did. But don't stop now. Ideally, we want the entire world to tune into the RP YouTube, give us millions of dollars, and just die right in front of their TVs. You know, that the whole like brain dead thing where like snot comes out of your nose and out of your mouth. Yes. Just like, eh, exactly that. So keep it up. Speaking of weird dreams, I've been taking um, like this like male fertility supplement just to like get my sperm in supercharge mode. <laughs> Do you, James, that's like putting extra armor on the world's greatest main battle tank. What are you doing? <laughs> I know, right? Uh, it's it's weird, but I've been running into a problem where um, it's it has a lot of zinc in it, and I've been like exceeding oh, my yes. like ZMA limit, and so for yes. like the last week, I've been waking up and, and having like paranoid like like i uh where I am remember, my dreams well that and like i there was a couple weird ones where i woke up and i was like man i really blew that that disney deal for rp and man i should have like i i don't know what i was thinking and then <laughs> I, woke, and I was like look at i'm thinking to myself like disney deal like what and what did that happen what and i had a couple other ones where i had like um i think i had like wrong to mafioso and i was like i gotta get oh, mel, yeah. mel and the dogs out of here we, we're, we're in trouble and i was like wait what and that's like, this is like a real thought I'm having as I'm waking up, like, man, I fucked up. I need to fix this. Um, 
You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then you like slowly comes to you as you're waking up like, oh, whoa, that was, that was a dream. Oh my God. You know, that's a pretty good movie of you wrong a mafioso and they show up to your house and Mel just one by one toasts them all out in the wilderness. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I was thinking of, it was kind of like, um, uh, what was that movie? I think it was with Tom Hanks, Road to Perdition, right? Is that the run where he's like on the run and with his kid or whatever? I've never seen that movie. Okay. That's basically like the dream I was having. Um, but Yikes, yeah, dude. but luckily uh, we have Mel here and lots of guns. And no mafia. Involved. No mafia. <laughs> so, but yes, I've been on the weird <laughs> dream wagon too, P. Nagy. Uh, I've been exceeding yeah. my zinc, my zinc oh, MRV yeah. for dreams. Is your uh, ejaculate volume bigger than normal? Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Woo. They got all that, uh, that what's it called? Maca. Just up, man? supercharges your 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 shit down there. How does it compare to truck stop ejaculoids? <laughs> well, that's like the best. I, I don't know what they put in there. It's like <laughs> that's like space jizz accelerator. I don't know. <laughs> it's like the opposite of a black hole for jizz. Just, just like ex- <laughs> white hole. <laughs> uh, <laughs> white hole. I didn't even any astute observers. Hole. The 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 adult video series White Holes Black Poles. Is <laughs> excellent. <laughs> All right. Next up is some on like dude, Milo is going to fucking write the uh, the show notes for this and be like, it's like, what are this? What are, of this? Am what I do we even do? call this? Some online project says, hey, docs, how does someone natural factor in blood and plasma donations or the training considerations? Want to donate, but admittedly held up by not knowing how to minimize gym interference. So first of all, get your blood work done and see where you are hematocrit and hemoglobin. You need to be like at the top half of the values. Otherwise, if you dip like way below that, it's just gonna suck for like actually a few weeks because red blood cells take a while to reconstruct. Plasma not as much, takes a few days, but red blood cells is weeks. So make sure you're at the top end or at least top half of the range. Then uh, donate right at the beginning of a deload week or an act of rest. And then by the time you're back to training, you'll feel mostly really good and expect to be maybe a little sluggish. And then after a few weeks, it'll be totally great. So that's probably our best advice, James. Yeah, that's really, that's the only thing I would say. I would say definitely don't do it when you have like your peak week coming up. That would be like probably the worst case scenario in terms of training. Oh God. Um, but other other than that, yeah, I would just plan it around like your lower activity times, like your deloads, your active rest, or maybe like week one kind of thing. Um, probably not a huge deal. But anytime after that, it's probably not good. Next up, week 1987. <laughs> A man that was almost certainly born in the year 19. He has like a funny uh, avatar too. Oh, yeah. So he goes, hi, guys. Love the content. My girlfriend refuses to believe that special sports supplements don't shrink men's sausage, despite me convincing her otherwise. I am not using and never will. Could you explain to her that they don't and perhaps address the answers to Camila? Ooh, Camila, you got named. Hashtag named. Oh, she's been doxxed. Camila, a SWAT team is delivering a pizza to your house as we speak. Isn't that what doxing is? So <laughs> here's the deal. Um, in some individuals, the use of anabolic androgenic agents will absolutely decrease the size of the testicles and not the penis. There is no mechanism by which they decrease penis size. And furthermore, it's not even in all people. So a lot of people are testicular size doesn't change. Uh, so uh, Camila, if you're thinking of stepping out on week 1987 with, uh, and, and having a ball with a steroid user, just don't expect his nuts to crush your head. Uh, his penis size should be independent of his use. I love that. Like the, the assumption is that like every like, steroids just make the whole, the whole package shrink. The whole thing small i think the number one reason why that is a myth is of course the lack of specificity and some some people knew there's some truth to that but not which one the number two reason and a huge reason of why people don't look in i think people are sort of using steroids means you're a big mean bully and and you're kind of alpha alpha and people want to bring those people down and there's no better justice in this universe to be like yeah but now your dick is small you know like it's just something like it's just something people want to comfort themselves with uh, so they can like still go to parties and feel manly around like jacked up dudes. And like, yeah, they're a bit of stick small. Like, yeah, it's not. And like, God damn it. Yeah. Or even if it, it is, is unrelated, it was already small. <laughs> right. Yeah. Be like, was it the steroids? Like, no, God, no. It's just <laughs> my 
when I walked into the you know seventh grade locker room, nobody batted an eye. <laughs> All right. Next up is six five one two. Chris. So we are like totally synchronized on this one for whatever reason. Awesome. Like, yeah, that's good. But I'm just like, what changed? Why are we? Why were we not synchronized before? Yeah. Right. Go YouTube. Go. Yeah. Chris says, hey, Docs, what do you think about the idea of biasing more of your sets in the 5 to 6 rep range as this builds strength and has equivalent hypertrophy as sets of 5 to 30? Would greater gains of strength potentiate better hypertrophy in the long run? So the answer to the second question is probably not. There's no mechanism by which that seems likely. Uh, what about the first one, James? What do you think the upsides and downsides are of uh, sticking in the 5 to 6 range? Shameless plug. Shameless. The hypertrophy book beats this to death beats it to death. Check that out. But kind of the quick and quick and dirty version is, right? So it is true that in a, if we're just looking at like, you know, growth per rep, it does seem like the, the heavier end of the five to 30 range maybe has some benefit in terms of how much stimulus you get per repetition. The trade-off there though, is that it also generates a lot more fatigue per repetition than doing something that's much lighter. And one of the problems that you run into is a much, uh, excuse me, is a wear and tear type issues from using such heavy weights. So although you might uh, be getting great growth out of doing squats, you know, for five sets of five to six, at some point you might start breaking down and it might be your knees. It might be your lower back. It could be your shoulders from just having to hold that heavy weight up, What you just find is that having to use that much weight. And I just use the squat as an example, pick your poison could be bench press or anything else. Um, what you tend to find is that the wear and tear from doing that much heavy work all the time tends to limit your ability to have long productive injury-free training. Um, so another problem that you run into with the heavier stuff is for a lot of people, they don't have a good mind-muscle connection at that range, or when you have to use exercises, which don't are not conducive to really good mind-muscle connection. So one, one or the other, um, and that might be a, a long-term trade-off you're making in terms of muscle growth as well. So although it's not a bad idea, if you are more fast twitch biased to maybe entertain that rep range a bit more, it's not a good idea to just arbitrarily pick that range, uh, pick that lower end of the range and say, well, I'm going to get stronger and more muscular. So it's probably better in, in some sense in the short term, maybe in the long term, you're probably making a, a, a very big trade-off in longevity and having to take more fatigue management strategies than if you just entertain some more moderate rep ranges. Totally. And James, like you said, you know, these are averages that people on average gain the same muscle for sets of five to six. Some people respond way better to higher reps than lower reps. And they're just for really, sure, you could be one of those or more likely one of your muscle groups could be one of those. You're like, man, my quads are doing great with sets of five to six. So are my hamstrings, but my fucking calves, just anything under 12 reps and they just don't, nothing happens. And it's kind of like, well, it's, it's like any dogmatic element. It starts to have some trade-offs and downsides. Yeah. I mean, like trying to do bicep curls for sets of five to six or like uh, deltoids, you know, it's like uh, laterals. Like, for sets yeah. Of five. <laughs> Fuck. It's a tough call. yeah. All right. Jack N. It's two questions. We'll Jack answer N. his first. The one with nine upvotes. How can we assess our volume landmarks for exercises that train similar muscles and performance elements? If I detect a dip in my clean performance, how do I know if it's attributable to my cleans? Snatches, squats, or pulls, seeing as they all affect similar systems. And what are the implications of that in making programs? So you actually can, you can't tell in any one element. What you do is you increase and decrease the volumes of all of those different elements over time. You add one in, take another away, and you watch for long-term trends. And after months and months and years and years, you can start to say things like, anytime I do a lot of low bar squatting, my fatigue starts to go up faster. Um, when I do front squatting, it's actually much less fast. You start to be able to make relativistic statement like that. MRVs are never in lifts. MRVs are in muscle groups. Um, so, I mean, it can be in lift, but this just doesn't tell you a whole lot. Because really the underlying muscle group is what's, what's fatigued. Um, so the implications of, of this in making programs is that you can get clarity on muscle groups, but you can't get clarity on lifts for lifts as to stimulus to fatigue ratio and thus how they affect your MRV. You can rate their SFRs individually. That's very easy. And then you can suspect that the ones with the really not so great SFRs probably affect your volume landmarks the most. So for example, if you know that, a let's say bent rows and dumbbell rows, bent rows just be the fuck up. Dumbbell rows just don't, you know, you could say, okay, my back MRV is this. And someone's like, well, I guess which part of, does dumbbell rows or barbell rows contribute more to your maximum recovery volume? 
probably barbell roses were way more fatiguing. That starts to become something you can do in the short term. In the longer term, of course, you just have to watch for these patterns and trends. You know, after years and years, someone's like, hey, you want to do incline barbell press? And you're like, nah, that doesn't have a great SFR for me. And it really just, every time I do it, it beats my shoulders up and it lowers my MRV. I'm like, well, how do you know it's your MRV is lowered by that? Well, because when I do flies or flat bench or these other things, my MRV is pretty high. But anytime I started inclining, including inclines, it seems that, that that's the sort of um, the one variable that reliably brings it down. Yeah, really good. And in the example of weightlifting, you could kind of look at some of the other things that you're doing and you can kind of break down like where you are starting to break down on your lifts and look at, so for example, if you notice that um, you're having troubles with lockouts and catches, and it seems that your like upper body is really what's holding you back. Like you got lots of pep, lots of jump, lots of explosiveness. And every time you try to catch in the snatch position or, you know, lock out your jerks, uh, you might find that like your upper body is actually the limiting factor on that. And you might have to go back and look and see like, okay, how much of this other upper body stuff was I doing and figure out, okay, at what point, uh, even though those not, might not be reaching their limits in terms of what they can handle, they're starting to influence my other lifts, like my snatch and my clean and jerk. And then you could also look at things like, all right, on some days, like I just can't even fucking lift this weight off. I'm just clarking it every time, which is like when you don't even do the pull, you just kind of deadlift it up. Um, you might find that, okay, well, actually now my like posterior chain muscles are just too taxed. Like I can't even just hold this bar up in position, right? Because my lower back and my glutes are just fried. And you might find like some days you can catch it, you can you can get it up, but you just got no speed, no power. It's just slow as fuck. And you just don't feel crisp. And that just might mean like you're literally in a too low of a state of overall preparedness to be explosive, right? So you just, you're not showing up with the preparedness needed to actually execute the overload stimulus for those movements. And that's as a result of probably either systemic fatigue, local fatigue, or some combination of both. So you can kind of, you can kind of put them together, but as Mike said, that's something that takes weeks and years of just monitoring and saying like, okay, how much, work off the floor am I doing? How much upper body stuff am I doing? I got to dial it back here, dial this one up here. And it just, it's a long guess and check process. Yeah. Next up, Tomer. Got it. He says, hey ducks, when I do more than two sets to my calves in a row, I almost never feel my calf mind muscle connection. Although at the end of the set, I feel a burn. I can't even feel it contracting. I think you said in one of your lectures is because too much metabolite prevents the nerve from communicating to the muscle. I do 15 to 25 reps. Is that a problem? Because I guess the RSM is falling quickly. It, will it be better for me to do more frequency and fewer sets? I do four sets per session, maybe just half sets in the 15, uh, five to 15 zone and the other uh, 15 to 25. You can try all those things. I would try another one. Try to rest longer between. That's seven. what I was going to say. Ah, yeah, James. I don't know. Do you want to explain why that's a good idea and we'll wrap that uh, question up? Um, yeah. So uh, one of the problems that you just might be running into is like really, really rapid onset metabolite accumulation, which is just preventing you from uh, getting a good mind muscle connection outside of the initial burn of the first like one or two sets. And it might just be like down regulating how much force you can actually use. So it's one of those things with the calves where like you might just take another 25, 30 seconds and it might be more than enough to get you back to having like a really productive set where you can feel a lot of tension and force in the muscle and, and actually focus on that um, kind of intrinsic, what's it called? Um, kinesthetic type feel for it. I think more often than not in these situations where you basically go flat instantly in a, in an exercise, it's just because you are not allowing enough recovery time, probably not allowing metabolites to clear out and you're just getting down regulated muscle contractions at that point. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let us know if it works. Adam Bean. Bean. Brother of long lost brother of Mr. Bean. <laughs> He says, is it possible to hit MRV by doing by going only one to three reps in reserve when I do Nordic hamstring curls? Even if I leave a few reps in the tank, my hamstrings are incredibly sore and take all week to recover. Yes, it absolutely is. So your MRV is going to be lower and lower uh, the closer and closer to failure your volume is. So if everything's to failure, it's going to be some number. If everything's one RIR, it's going to be a little higher, two RIR a little higher. But for some muscles that are taking an incredible amount of eccentric damage, like the hamstrings in exercises like the Nordic curl, um, then even if you stay very uh, shy of failure, your maximum recovery volume can be very low or just you can just take a lot of huge hit from it. So that's totally fine. And remember, that's like the biggest insight for the volume landmarks is they are whatever they are for you because there's a very easy, logical, mathematical way to figure them out, especially MRV. Then you just know what they are for you and you go from there. Um, we've had a lot of very similar questions over the 
probably over the years really about like, Hey, especially about hamstrings, like, Hey guys, my MRV on hamstrings is real low. Is there something wrong with me? No, James and I have very low MRVs on hamstrings too. And most people don't. As a matter of fact, with the James Hoffman squint method of people claiming their MRVs are very high, that method works the best on hamstrings. Cause James and I have been in, in touch with many people who are like, yeah, I can do 25 sets of hamstrings a week. Bullshit. Fucking bullshit. Let me see how you yeah. do it. It's like partial range, everything, barely any RIR. And you're like, watch this. Do three strict sets of stiff legged deadlifts properly, anteriorly uh, tilted pelvis, knees forward. And all of a sudden, that person can't fucking walk to their car and they're sore for a week and a half. And it's like, so what were, what were you doing? And they're like, eh. Yeah, so, fuckery. That's what they were yeah, doing. Hamstrings take a big beating. And like in this case, Adam, um, you prop that I find the Nordic curl to be kind of a silly exercise, not because it's bad. I just, it's one of those funny ones where it doesn't really feel like you're doing much, but in this case, clearly it's probably a really high SFR movement for you in terms of like what you put in and what you get out. So if you're getting like crippled, crippling soreness from it, it might mean you only need to do like two sets and you're, you're, you're good. Right. And you don't need to be sore. Like for the entire week, you might just be overdoing it because you're like, Oh, this is like a relatively easy movement. It's comparatively to like a good morning or a stiff legged like deadlift. So my guess is you might be doing like four or five sets and then you're fucked up for the whole week. Maybe just try two or three and see how that goes. Cause it's probably a good SFR movement for you. Yeah. All right. Yushi. Got it. Yushi. <laughs> Yoshi, Yoshi, Yoshi. He says, why do you typically feel more sore the day uh, slash following days after a training session rather than immediately after? This is a phenomenon that you can Google called DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness. And the reason it occurs is the damage itself doesn't make you very sore, but the damage is significant enough to where the immune system with all of its many different types of often very large cells uh, need to infiltrate the muscle, actually unzip the muscle fiber itself and start helping to fix and heal the damage and uh, potentiate adaptation. And these immune components, when they unzip the muscle cells, all kinds of nasty shit comes floating out and hits the nerves. And the local swelling itself hits the nerves and a bunch of other metabolites of uh, immune system cells themselves and the immune system cells themselves pressing up against nerve cells. And all of a sudden that creates a very high inflammatory, very uh, nerve sensitive painful environment yeah yeah and that's like a like mike said that's a really something easy you can look up and there's a variety of different inflammatory mechanisms that contribute so it's it's hard to pin down to one exact thing but yeah easy to easy to find yeah all right last question for the day oh. is from our very uh regular high vote high upvoted you know, it was just funny. Like it's super high upvoted, but it's way down here. Henrik Anderson. Yeah, he consistently delivers. But, but like, why is the why is the fuck is it all the way down here? Maybe no one commented on it. I don't know. That's what I was thinking. And then um, you look at Yushi, and he only has ten and no comments. So it's like it's it doesn't even make it's like not even internally consistent. What's the deal? What's the deal? What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Henrik Anderson says, "How do you go about counting sets?" When the raw stimulus magnitude isn't very high, a good example of those would be leg extensions. With six sets, average quad and MV of weekly leg extensions, can't do any squat variations due to an injury be enough to maintain size. So remember the six average sets of quad uh, maintenance. So first of all, it's average for everyone. This the entire you know, human population altogether of relatively weight trained people. So it could be different for you. And it's for the average exercise. If you do like high bar ass to grass squats and you're super well leveraged to get a huge beating out of them, maybe able to do two or three sets of squats per week and have no problem maintaining your quad size. Matter of fact, that's definitely true. If you do one set Monday, Wednesday, Friday, one hard set of squatting, there's no way you're losing quad size. It's just not going to happen. But uh, what about leg extensions? Well, you have to find a level of leg extending that can maintain your quad size by experimentation. And you already know it's probably going to be more leg extensions in your case because you seem to not get a lot of raw stimulus magnitude out of them. I don't either. James gets a huge raw stimulus magnitude out of leg extensions. So it's different for him still. So how do you go about counting sets when they are some very high? Exactly the same as usual, but you just got to realize that the number of sets you end up with as your maintenance volume will be different. Also, I would suggest, I think James and I probably both suggest staying away from such isolations as the core of your maintenance because uh, there's a lot of other muscles of the leg you'd have to adjust for if you just did quad stuff like adductors, yes. sartorius, yes. and glutes, and 
even oh, within nice. the quads, even within the quads, oh. right? The knee extension is really like, it's going to hit that the VMO or whatever you want to call it, the medial quad decently. And then the rest is kind of depends on if it's a good fit for you or not. And so there's a huge swath of quad that you might not be hitting at all. Yeah. We do recommend compound uh, squatting style or pressing style quad movements for maintenance because they hit all that muscle and make sure that because like if you just do leg extensions you're physically your quads or at least most of them will recede in size but if that's really you do like hamstring curls and extensions for that's all you do for your legs maybe you do a glute something or other you know you lose adductor size and, and then you'll come back to squatting and be like but my quads were maintained how come i'm so much weaker because there's other muscles involved so yeah so I think he mentioned he was like uh, maybe dealing with some injury. So I would say like, if you could do something like a leg press, something that's manageable for yourself, where you're just getting a little bit of a different look and not just doing all knee extensions. I think doing all knee extensions would be like not terrible, but not great either. If you could have like one day that was like, okay, I did some like hack squats if, that, if, you, if it's tolerable or some leg press, great. And then you could do knee extensions on like your second session per week or something. And that would, that would be fine. That would be like a fine way to do it. But I, I would try to avoid, and I have a couple of clients right now that they're doing mass phases and that's basically the exact, they're doing upper body focus and their lower body is like one day they do squats uh, and like hamstring curls. And then one day they do like a stiff leg, a deadlift and like a knee extension. Like you have like a heavy light kind of split, pretty easy. That's, that's totally fine for maintenance type stuff. Yeah. That's it. Woo. All right. Let's see. Any announcements? Um, keep tuned on, uh, if you guys haven't noticed on social media, we typically have been running some sales on a lot of our eBooks. Yeah. So you can usually grab each week, one or two uh, books at a pretty good price. So if you want to, I think uh, pretty good, you can do better than that, James. It's a, a phenomenal, unbelievable it's like $2 price. A book. We're losing money here. It's, it's on Amazon. So we don't actually lose any money, but, um, yeah, let's check that out. Uh, let's see. I, we recorded the audios for the uh, hypertrophy book and for the habits building. And Scott has sent me those files. We're just doing our kind of final quality checks on those. So that might not get posted for a minute, just but it's in the works. So that's moving along. Dr. Mike, you got anything going? YouTube, always more YouTube. We're shooting a bunch of different stuff. Um, if you guys are interested in like, sociological type stuff and obesity and stuff. Um, uh, Ethan Suplee and I have a podcast out on the American Glut podcast about the Hayes movement, health at every size. And it's kind of pluses and minuses. We do like an hour of the pluses and the things the movement says that are really good. And like an hour of minuses are like kind of insane shit. They say it makes no goddamn sense. So if you're interested in that, I would check that out. Uh, just American Glut and podcast and uh, give that a whirl trying to think is there any other rp stuff that's coming around for now i think that's about it it's all just secret project work secret projects that's right you need security clearance folks and you don't have it so for that reason we're signing off thanks for engaging with us this week and we will talk to you next time peace